so that we could start at any arbitrary point in time. Let's say yesterday. And then all of our memories before yesterday would simply have been preloaded. Hello, hello, hello. The memory of every single person is related because we share memories of common events. Thus, there's an enormous amount of work to be done. I'm Michael Millerman. I'm going to be reading some articles on Russia, Ukraine. But in the meantime, what you hear playing is the flashbulb, our simulacra. You have to check this guy out, the flashbulb, Ben Jordan. You can find his music at flashbulb.bandcamp.com. Hopefully you can hear this. Great, great music. Well, I thought we'd try to have some music going on in the background, at least for a bit. The Flashbulb, absolutely fantastic composer, great music educator, Ben Jordan, B-E-N-N. Jordan, you can check out his YouTube channel. He's got a lot of great videos on gear, on composition. One of the things that he's fantastic at is drum programming. So this song's killer, Simulacrum. And by the way, if you look up the video for this on YouTube, it's a pretty killer video, uh, Ben Jordan, the flashbulb. But one of the things that he's pretty incredible at is uh, drum programming. And if I could find, for example, uh, his album, let's see. Well, maybe this will give you a quick taste of it. Yes, I know the video title says Russia, Ukraine. We're going to get into that in a minute. But I just thought I would put some music on, mostly to see whether or not it works. And I think it does. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, he does some drum programming that's just out of this world. But uh, I don't want to take a lot of time looking for it now. Uh, huh, 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 huh. Yeah. Ben Jordan, the flashbulb. Great stuff. Okay, well, let's go over to the articles and give them a read. I'm going to have the music on, if that's okay with you, I'll just turn it down maybe a little bit, like that. Okay, well, these are articles that I pulled up. I haven't read them yet, and I'm curious to see what they say. Let's have a look at them together. Uh, actually, hold on, the music is a nice way to start things off, but it's gonna distract me as I read. So let's have our focus now on the articles, okay. This is the Kremlin Playbook 3 by Heather Conley and this person, Donashian Roy. This is not a super recent release. I think it's from the end of uh, 2021, but let's have a look, shall we? From a U.S. perspective, the separation of religion from state is sacrosanct. The drafters of the Constitutional Convention believed that the state should have no power to influence its citizens toward or away from any religion. The First Amendment of the Bill of Rights enshrines this protection from state interference and specifically protects an individual's right to freely worship. But what if a foreign power were to actively seek to influence religious and traditional views to further its own agenda? This is a new and particularly pernicious front of Russia's malign influence campaigns, Combating it will be a uniquely difficult challenge for the United States. Hold on, I'm going to make myself uh, taking up too much of the screen there, am I not? Let's try that. This is a new and particularly pernicious front of Russia's malign influence campaigns. Combating it will be a uniquely difficult challenge for the United States and its European allies, which already have very different religious traditions and relationships to historical and cultural identity. How can these governments protect citizens' religious beliefs, traditions, and values from malign influence while at the same time not encroaching upon religious freedom? Until that question is answered, Russia will continue to use traditional and conservative values to foster division, according to this article, within Western societies. 
a genuine expression of political and cultural preferences. Conservatism is a political philosophy based on tradition and social stability, stressing established institutions and preferring gradual development to abrupt change. Russia is using tactics designed to strategically exploit or heighten elements of this set of beliefs in order to further its political goal in key states. Russia is using tactics designed to strategically exploit or heighten elements of what set of beliefs? Beliefs based on tradition and social stability, stressing established institutions and preferring gradual development to abrupt change. Okay, maybe a weird thing to accuse them of, but let's go on. What is strategic conservatism? There is an important difference between conservatism, which contains political, cultural, religious, and identity elements, and Russia's use of strategic conservatism. Strategic conservatism reflects the idea that political and cultural preferences can be used as tools of influence. It encompasses a specific set of means used by the Kremlin and at times the Russian Orthodox Church and other outlets to achieve a range of Russian domestic and foreign policy objectives. Sorry, let me just... This concept inflates the value of customs and tradition by prioritizing unquestioned respect for hierarchy of the regime or religious supremacy and collective interests over the interests of the individual. By the way, those of you who are just checking in, I'm reading this article that came up on my feed, the Kremlin Playbook 3, released by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, just having a look at it together with you for the first time. This concept, again, inflates the value of customs and tradition by prioritizing unquestioned respect for hierarchy and collective interests over the interests of the individual. Strategic conservatism is frequently defined in opposition to Western democratic ideals of pluralism and liberalism in defense of Russian actions and in support of the Putin regime's longevity. But Russia's view of conservatism is very different from how the West perceives the Kremlin's instrumentalization of strategic conservatism. The rapid and destabilizing change in Russia in the 1990s compelled the Kremlin to reconstruct a great power narrative for Russia built upon its historical traditions through the creation of a moral framework. This framework protects these traditions and orders the domestic and international landscape according to certain values, such as the God-given value of diversity among nations and the need for a multipolar world order based on pluriculturalism in the words of Russian President Vladimir Putin. By the way, those of you who know I do work on Alexander Dugin may know that I translated this work of his, now available in English, called Theory of a Multipolar World. I'm just going to drop that into the chat. And Dugin has this textbook on international relations theory where he covers the usual schools. And towards the end of that textbook, he offers up his own theory of a multipolar world. And as you see from this article, multipolarity is part of the uh, conceptual strategic conservative vocabulary of Russian President Vladimir Putin. The Orthodox faith is the moral arbiter of this framework in the eyes of the Russian Orthodox Church. Any effort to promote or give parity to other religions or values is seen as detrimental to and ultimately destructive of Russia's unique moral and cultural civilization. And I guess many of you are familiar with those among the conservatives in the U.S. who look to Putin, uh, how could you put it, not in every sense favorably, but they find something to resonate with in this defense of moral and cultural civilization. Uh, orthodox in the case of Russia, something else in the case of America, but the principle of the defense of the moral and cultural civilization clearly is attractive to some people. Any change must be carefully managed so as not to disrupt political status or cultural identities within this framework. From a Western point of view, this pluriculturalism is a way for the Russian regime I guess this is another way of them putting uh, multipolarity. You could say uh, ethnopluralism or uh, sort of a Eurasian outlook to peoples. From a Western point of view, this pluriculturalism is a way for the Russian regime to maintain internal control and prevent the international community from imposing universal values on Russia. Uh, no quotation marks there quote-unquote universal values maybe, I don't know, we'll see. So prevent the international community from imposing universal values on Russia or promoting them from within. The regime believes these universal values produce color revolutions that threaten its stability by subverting its legitimacy 
and disrupting its domestic and cultural order. From this angle, the Kremlin's need for internal control reinforces its incentives to set forth its own brand of conservatism as an opposition to Western ideals of democratic governance. So if you're a country like Russia and you don't want to have universal values, quote unquote, imposed on you, then you need to have some model of cultural and moral civilizational self-understanding that allows you, in the logic of this article, strategically to defend your interests, uh, broadly construed. Thus, again, the Kremlin's need for internal control reinforces its incentives to set forth its own brand of conservatism as an opposition to Western ideals of democratic governance. Just looking over at the chat for a minute. So Carvo, do policymakers actually read this as some profound insight? It's very surface level. That may be, I don't know who does and doesn't read the Center for Strategic and International Studies Kremlin playbook article that we're reading. Sometimes I would assume policymakers, because of the demands of practical activity, don't have time to read uh, too, too far below the surface level of things. And they're just looking for a kind of brief that gives them some point of orientation. But I don't know, good question. How does Putin square that away with the Islamic civilizations of the Caucasus that are in his orbit? Uh, that's a good question as well. I think if you had a look at the idea of the imposition of universal values, it could give some thing of a way to understand the relationship to the Islamic civilizations to the extent that they try to universalize or proselytize or destroy what's uniquely Russian. They would not be considered friendly to Eurasianism and to the extent that they can be interpreted within that broader framework, they would be. Uh, Dugan, for what it's worth, has written a little bit about that and lectured a little bit about that. I'm not sure whether he has in English, but in Russian for sure. Let's go back to the article. Russia's implementation of strategic conservatism has several leading actors. These actors either take their cues from the Kremlin, act on their own interests, or a combination of the two. Putin is a leading proponent of strategic conservatism along with the ROC, which relies on a network of affiliated and friendly non-governmental organizations. ROC, again, uh, Russian Orthodox Church. The Kremlin is also assisted by a group of Orthodox entrepreneurs, e.g. Orthodox oligarchs, and intellectuals who support either Putin or the ROC's efforts, principally Konstantin Malofeyev, Vladimir Yakunin, and Alexander Dugin. Let's, uh, something I wanted to share, which was, I don't know whether I'll be able to pull it up. Hold on. Uh, okay, never mind. But you may have seen, you may have seen Jordan Peterson recently reposting on his Twitter feed an article having to do, I would say sympathetically, with, uh, with Russian strategic conservatism, pointing out that they're defending the kinds of things there that he and his followers believe we should be supporting here, like a defense of civilization and trying to guard against collapse, degradation, degeneration, and decay. All right, let's look back at the article. These actors work along parallel tracks to accomplish a set of goals. By the way, if someone could drop that in the chat, that'd be nice. These actors work along parallel tracks to accomplish a set of goals that serve the Kremlin's interests. Some of these goals are broad and strategic, while others are more focused on some actors' narrower interests. Through strategic conservatism, the Kremlin aims to advance the following goals. I'm going to look at this list in a minute. Just going over to the chat for a second here. Yeah, the flashbulb is amazing. I strongly recommend people who are into a nice combination of melodic lines and sometimes blisteringly fierce, intricate, complex percussive parts. Check out the flashbulb.bandcamp.com or Ben Jordan's YouTube channel, which is a little bit different, focuses on other kind of uh, gear reviews and things like that. Okay, this is something really fishy. Russia knows well she cannot maintain a war against the, US, uh, against the USA, let alone NATO. And Carvo has Dugan analyzed the conflicts between the ethnic Russians and other ethnicities within Russia's sphere, such as Russia, uh, Georgian war. Yeah, if you look up Dugan 2008 Georgia, you'll see some articles, I think, in English that discuss that. And in his ethnosociology book, there's a part that I did not translate, which you might find interesting if you have any facility in Russian, where once he sets out his model of ethnosociological analysis, he applies it within the Russian context. 
But in any event, you can definitely find in English some things that Dugan has written about the Russia-Georgia war and for sure things that he's written about Russia and Kazakhstan. One of them I have up here for us to read a little bit later, as well as Russia-Belarus and uh, things like that. Okay, back to the article. We are here. Through strategic conservatism, the Kremlin aims to advance the following goals. Reduce pro-Western sentiment in targeted countries. Increase support for Russia's policy actions domestically and abroad. And legitimize the Kremlin's narratives. Undermine support for EU membership among member states and reduce support for EU and NATO membership within aspirant countries. Keep countries in the post-Soviet space within Russia's sphere of influence. Undermine internal cohesion, sovereignty, and potentially territorial integrity in a way that supports the Kremlin's interests, e.g. Bosnia. Maybe people also thinking Moldova with Prednistrovia or Transnistria and other examples. Displace or weaken the leadership of the ecumenical patriarchate who is seen as hindering a consolidated orthodox world under Russian leadership. And lift sanctions, a collateral and longer term gain, and nudge Western governments toward accommodating Russia's policy interests. The actors of strategic conservatism pursue some of these goals in parallel or in collaboration and through certain channels, both at home and abroad. Uh, thank you, those who are here. We're reading the Center for Strategic and International Studies article on, uh, it's called the Kremlin Playbook 3. And as you see, it's on this topic of strategic conservatism. Russia's strategic conservatism in practice. Russia's strategic conservatism operates internationally through two main multi-directional channels to gain influence and reap political benefits. The first channel is the Orthodox world, and in particular, the construction of a united Orthodox world under Moscow's protection. This is the religious expression of what is known as the Third Rome narrative. In the Moscow Patriarchate's view, the 15th century conquest of Constantinople by the Ottoman Empire displaced the center of Orthodox Christianity to Moscow, making it the Third Rome. This is both a theological and political concept, which serves the Kremlin's interests to be seen as the center of pan-Slavic power and authentic inher inheritor of these empires. For what it's worth, just on the Dugan side, not commenting on, on the other figures who were mentioned, Eurasianism is uh, not just Slavic. Okay, so he distinguishes Eurasianism from Slavophilism and certainly from um, Russian nationalism. But okay, let's go on here. So again, this is both a theological and political concept which serves the Kremlin's interest to be seen as the center of pan-Slavic power and authentic inheritor of these empires. Uh, let's have a look at this. Russia's strategic conservatism, two channels of influence, orthodox world, traditional values, religious expression of third Rome, political cultural expression of third Rome. Let's look at the aims of the orthodox world first. Elevate Russia as the defender of faith. Present Russian Orthodox Church as the true inheritor of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Create distrust of other faiths. Reduce legitimacy of secular authorities perceived as encroaching on religious freedom. Foster support for Russia's actions abroad when in defense of the faithful. And the aims of the political cultural expression of Third Rome under the category here traditional values augment the decadent West narrative, present Western liberal values as a threat to national identity, question authority or legitimacy of a country's leadership, doubt the value of EU or NATO membership, reduce potency of criticism for internal policies by advocating non-interference in domestic choices. And now the actors on the Orthodox world side, the Russian Orthodox Church, cultural organizations and NGOs, Orthodox entrepreneurs, media channels, and the actors on the traditional values side, also the Russian Orthodox Church, cultural organizations, NGOs, Orthodox entrepreneurs, media channels, Kremlin and affiliates, and political parties. That is a uh, presentation of Russia's strategic conservatism produced by the people we're reading here, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Okay, we're going to continue on with the article in a minute. Just give me a quick... Uh, a quick coffee break.
Nice to see everybody. Hope you're having a great day. Feel free to hatch it out in the chat and in the comments. Background music here is the flashbulb, the flashbulb.bandcamp.com, Ben Jordan. Great combination of melodic lines and complex, intricate percussive parts. I like Ben Jordan. He also made a couple of videos about Behringer, this music company that had promised to support musical education for youth and he really held their feet to the fire and made sure they delivered on their promises. He's a good guy making good music and doing good work. Ben Jordan, the flashbulb. Okay, that was our little musical interlude. As you see, incorporating something new. And let's go back to our article, the Kremlin Playbook 3, Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we are here now. Strategic conservatism elevates Russia as the defender of the faithful and closely associates the church with Vladimir Putin, just as the spiritual leadership of Russian Tsars was associated with the church. By doing so, strategic conservatism creates distrust of other faiths and secular authorities that are perceived as challenging Ru Russia's authentic leadership and protection of the faithful. The second channel is a broader ecosystem of traditional values that constitute the political cultural implementation of the third Rome concept. Through media, NGOs, political parties, Russian officials, and norms entrepreneurs, the Kremlin effectively challenges the tenets of Western liberalism. These channels spread the argument that liberalism threatens religious beliefs, which in turn threatens the national identity that is so closely tied to these beliefs. This is the narrative of quote-unquote Western decadence and the West's loss of identity as it abandons religiosity and tradition, making association with Europe and the United States a threat to believers and conservatives everywhere. This is how strategic conservatism seeks to break a societal consensus around the liberal democratic order by reducing its attraction and building support for Russia's policy preferences within specific constituencies. As a malign influence force multiplier, strategic conservatism builds on and uses Russia's existing propaganda and disinformation networks, including news outlets funded or supported by Russia. It employs cyber and hacking tools to undercut other actors or narratives or to provide plausible deniability to the Kremlin. And it can create connections to constituencies or affinity groups that would otherwise not be receptive to Russian posturing, either for historical reasons or more recent geopolitical developments as in Georgia. Russia versus the decadent West. The economic upheavals Migration pressures and speed of social change over the past decade in the West have spurred intense debate over specific and competing visions of society. Russia has benefited from this societal division, particularly related to debates around cultural and traditional values and religious beliefs. It has focused primarily on three areas where societal tensions appear highest. First, the defense of the traditional family, marriage between a man and a woman, typically within a patriarchal system in opposition to Western support for same-sex marriage and non-traditional families, including, maybe we could add, synthetic wombs. In case anybody has been on Twitter today, this debate serves Russia by exacerbating divisions between religious communities, Orthodox followers, as well as Catholic and Muslim communities, and those who support same-sex marriage. In 2013, the Russian government demonstrated its leadership on this issue by passing a federal law for the purpose of protecting children from information, advocating for a denial of traditional family values. 2013, what would you say in hindsight, if you remember the Sochi Olympics and everything that was being heaped on Putin and his federal law at that time? In retrospect, in the American context, as you look back over this federal law for the purpose of protecting children from information, advocating for denial of traditional family values, well, we have, uh, we have some hindsight here to see whether that law in principle was a good one and putin has recently rebranded russian citizens who defend lgbtq plus rights as western foreign agents second is the protection of a uniquely cultural and historical national identity against western policies related to demographic diversity let me just go back for a minute so we're looking at three areas where societal tensions appear highest and where russia is using this strategic conservatism the first one was defense of the traditional family. The second one is the protection of a unique cultural and historical national identity. 
Here, traditionalism and identity are fused together, such that disrupting one threatens the other. Any demographic change, particularly immigration from Muslim-majority and non-white countries, exacerbated in the public perception by low birth rates, is viewed as a direct challenge to identity and tradition. It's kind of like you combine Elon Musk's concern with birth rates, with uh, Zemmour's concern about uh, immigration from Muslim-majority countries, etc. But here we have this in the Russian context. Therefore, Western governments' perceived support of multiculturalism, welcoming of migrants, and celebration of diversity, such as LGBTQ plus parades, create fissures that the Kremlin exploits. It does so by stoking demographic panic through social media amplification that highlights the perceived dangers and threats of all these elements to national identity. So clicking over to the chat here for a minute. I see there's a conversation going. Good, very nice. Uh, thank you, by the way, those of you who are here. I'm just reading over this article on the Kremlin playbook from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. The third narrative is that Russia, as the sole defender of traditional values, is a savior, Katahan and uh, Dugan's terminology, that wants to protect the West from itself by preventing its decadence and ruin. The Russian Orthodox Church is a key partner in spreading this message. Its claim to represent authentic orthodoxy is closely tied to the defense of believers from Western decadence and its aim to take over the leadership of global orthodoxy. It increasingly speaks to conservative believers in Europe, including Catholics. Just a quick aside here. Uh, a book that I recommend. I read it last year, uh, about a year ago. Aristotle East and West by David Bradshaw. A nice book about the underlying receptions of Aristotle that differentiate Western and Eastern Christianity. I'm not saying it's the last word on any of those topics, but for those of you who are inclined to try to understand the difference between East and West Christendom through a metaphysical Aristotelian or philosophical lens, you could certainly do worse than, uh, than reading this good book. Okay, back over here. Here, the Kremlin has flipped the script. In 1991, the West saved, quote-unquote, Russia from communism. Now Russia believes it is saving, quote-unquote, the West from its own decadence by promoting strategic conservatism. However, this Russian rescue mission demands obedience to the collective rather than respect for individual rights and religious freedoms. Just for the sake of those of you who watch me because you have an interest in Alexander Dugan, or if you happened upon this stream and you have an interest in Alexander Dugan, this distinction between individualism and collectivism, there's a writing of his that you should be aware of in English. It's in this volume called, I'm going to put it in the chat, Heidegger in Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, Dugan has a chapter that I translated in that collection of essays where he explains that, at least for his political theory, the target is not to replace individualism by collectivism, but very much along the lines of his Heideggerianism to find a more fundamental basis for political thinking, something that is neither strictly speaking individual nor strictly speaking communal, but somehow, I mean, it's not easy to understand, but in Heidegger, it's the self or the selbst. And Dugan has tried to explore that theoretical notion of something that underlines, excuse me, underlies the division the bifurcation into individual and community on one hand. So there's actually a lot that you can think about when it comes to that particular division. It's not as easy as we're anti-individualist, therefore we are collectivist or vice versa. It may be possible to think philosophically and theoretically about something besides that dichotomy. But anyway, let's go back to the text. Apologize for the aside. Europe is dying, writes Konstantin Malafeev in this quote. The West in U.S. President Reagan's time helped for this communism smoke to get out from Russia. Now it's our turn. We have to pray for the liberal smoke to get out from Europe and America. These narratives are primarily pushed by the Kremlin and affiliated actors. However, in many countries, there is a bottom-up demand for these ideas and Russia's values leadership. And I guess the article is now going to turn to uh, that bottom-up demand, which it characterizes as local enablers of Russian strategic conservatism. Russia uses these narratives to identify and appeal to local actors and cultivate outreach to them. 
With little investment, the Kremlin has targeted specific messaging or deepened divisions on both sides of the debate. Some cultural organizations that gravitate around political circles are sympathetic to Russia's civilizational mission to save Christianity and the vision of Russia as the last white world. Some among French political and cultural circles have supported Russia's intervention in Syria because it supposedly protected Eastern Christians against Islamization. Some representatives even traveled to Syria in 2015 and 2016. Representatives of business interests, some of whom are connected to conservative or traditionalist circles, share some ideological affinities with the Kremlin, have financial interests in Russia, or are tied to Russian business interests in their countries. Some business actors operate directly in politics, while others fund religious and traditional communities. This is the case, for example, of Ivan Savidis, a Russian-Greek dual citizen who has invested in church construction and pilgrimage tourism in Greece and on Mount Athos. European and U.S. political parties and politicians have also praised Russia's model on LGBTQ plus issues, nationalism and sovereignty, and family values through its legislation and messaging. Others extol Russian leadership and defense of traditional values in opposition to the European Union and the NATO alliance and its protection against certain religious and ethnic groups. Just looking out the window, another very snowy day here in Montreal. Although there are limits to developing localized networks and local issues may be too narrowly defined to support broader Russian interests, there have been benefits to cultivating local affinity networks that can be used at the right time. The limits of strategic conservatism. Russia's deployment of strategic conservatism has created sympathetic networks across Europe and the United States. However, its achievements sometimes remain aspirational and its strategies and tools are at times contradictory and show certain limitations. First, while at home, the Kremlin appeals simultaneously to imperial and Soviet nostalgia to reinforce national identity and historical continuity. Uh, these areas are sharply at odds with each other and entailed markedly different treatments of the Orthodox Church. Abroad, appeals to traditional values or national identity have at times become so aggressive that local actors or the Kremlin's partners are brought to the attention of national authorities which diminishes their broader appeal or impedes their activities. Second, the Kremlin and the Russian Orthodox Church are not always in alignment. There are ongoing tensions between these two entities and even within the Russian Orthodox Church itself. Some of these conflicts became very visible during the COVID-19 pandemic, when some within the Russian Orthodox Church in the name of religious freedom refused to accept state-sponsored restrictions to protect public health. And despite the Kremlin's efforts, orthodoxy remains a largely cultural label for many in Russia, which could explain the ROC's international push for followers abroad. Finally, the Kremlin fundamentally does not engineer cultural wars. It exploits existing cracks in societies by identifying natural ideological connections within certain countries and using local actors. Some of these actors do genuinely connect on an intellectual or values level and do not hide this affinity, while others try to hide these ties. Resentment and grievances unleashed by rapid social change have brought together a disparate political, excuse me, have brought together disparate political forces that find safe harbor in traditionalism and decrying the decadent West. Rapid social change. Across a broad ideological spectrum, Russia positions itself as a defender of the traditional order and conservative values, the political and cultural embodiment of the Third Rome. The Kremlin amplifies this message through U.S. and European conservative networks and norms, entrepreneurs, and relays them through a media ecosystem that overlaps with right-wing and populist circles. On occasion, these messages can radicalize individuals. For example, in Ukraine, Orthodox foreign fighters reportedly joined the conflict in eastern Ukraine from abroad in support of Russian-backed separatists they viewed as engaged in a righteous endeavor. Recognizing Russia's use of strategic conservatism and identifying its tools and sources of funding is a fundamental part of understanding Russia's malign influence. To prevent Russia from fueling societal and cultural divisions in the West, the United States must recognize that Russia ultimately seeks to undermine the democratic tenet of respect for the rights and religious freedoms of the individual. Only then will it be possible to protect the spirit of the First Amendment and quote-unquote keep the faith. Okay, so we've been reading this article. I'll tell you the authors in a minute. I was reading it for the first time together with you. The Kremlin Playbook by Heather Conley, 
and Donatian Rui. This was published, I think, in October 2021. Let's just quickly see the authors here. Former Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic at CSIS and Associate Fellow, Russia, Europe, and Eurasia program. So I hope you enjoyed that, found it interesting, gave us some things to think about. You can post in the chat or in the comments what you think the authors got right, what you think they got wrong. What are the limitations of this kind of analysis? Does it fail to pay any attention at all to the possibility of the West's decadence and degeneration and instead put all of the blame on Russia's strategic exploitation? And is the West just trying to defend something that is indefensible? In other words, how do we supplement the strategic conservatism analysis with the analysis of the failures of liberalism to be <laughs> attractive, defensible, and whatever else we might need to say about it for the sake of a thorough going analysis? So again, just looking over at the chat, appreciate those of you who are here, who have spent uh, time together. I had actually a couple of other articles pulled up. I'm not sure we have time to go through them. Let me just think for a moment. There's this Curtis Yarvin post, and I'm not publishing anything here unfairly. This was a free post of his from his Grey Mirror Substack that you can go check out if you want to see what Curtis Yarvin has to say. Uh, let's see. Well, let me show you what else I have up here, and we'll decide whether to go through something together now or not. Here's Niccolo Soldo, his Substack, as you see, what it's called. Uh, the reason that I have this up is because I'd posted an excerpt on my Twitter from Curtis Yarvin's article. And Niccolo let me know that he had written something quite similar. So I wanted to make sure he gets credit as well if they're saying, uh, making the same point or if they had a conversation about it or if there's some sort of direct or indirect influence. And then another article I have up here is Dugan on Kazakhstan could be interesting to see what he has to say there. As you know, there were some events recently in Kazakhstan, and it could be interesting to get Dugan's analysis. And lastly, we have our music, the flashbulb, Ben Jordan. You can't see the URL. I'm just going to drop it here because I kind of want to include some more music in these streams from time to time. And the flashbulb is great. All right, well, let's take, uh, how long is this? All right, we're going to do it. I don't know about the other ones, but we're going to do this. A new foreign policy for Europe. Give Russia a free hand on the continent. Gray Mirror, Substack, Curtis Yarvin. Let's go. Update for actually correct Ukrainian hate facts. See this clarification. We'll skip that for now, but I direct you to it because obviously it's an important part of the story. Either that fool Putin is about to invade the Ukraine or doing an excellent job of pretending to be. This is very encouraging for clowns like me who still believe in history. It suggests that history at the late year of 2022 might not even be over. It might not even have begun. Some Americans believe that this is unacceptable. That, to paraphrase FDR, America's frontier is in the Carpathians. Uh, for those who believe that Europe, even Eastern Europe, is America, full of proto-Americans who have not yet taken the trouble to apply for their blue passports, there's no alternative but to fight to defend the sovereign nation of Ukraine and its important energy resources, etc., along with the fundamental principles of international law. America must defend herself. This aggression will not stand. The utterly realistic concept of guerrilla war in 21st century Europe has even been broached by the sensible grown-up department paid $750 billion a year to defend the USA. Seems like a good idea, right? Let's start with some geopolitical facts. Ukraine was the core of the original Russian state and had, till New Order was abandoned, been a province of Russia roughly since James II was king of America. The Ukraine is slightly less Russian than Texas is American and way more Russian than Alsace, how do you pronounce that? Alsace is French. Sorry about my pronunciation, kind of embarrassing, but what can I tell you? There were a few centuries when it was overrun by the Turks or something. Any civilized Ukrainian speaks perfectly good Russian. The Ukrainian language is a peasant dialect. Uh, the president of Ukraine is not even fluent in this Ukrainian argo, which is slightly more important in normal urban life than Welsh in Wales. By the way, just in case anybody sees me reading this, flips out about anything, I'm reading Curtis Yarvin's Grey Mirror Substack Free Aversion, A New Foreign Policy for Europe. 
Like South Sudan, the modern nation of Ukraine is a joke drafted by the State Department, a historical coincidence conceived in Stalin and Aldrich Hiss's collusion to give the former one UN vote in the very important General Assembly for each of his provinces, then given birth in one of born Yeltsin's vodka binges. And Wilhelm II is in the picture too somehow, and it was a great way to break up the Soviet Union. Well, you don't really have to guess what Curtis, Curtis Yarvin's views on the historical context are. He tells you quite clearly there the situation as I see it. Now freshly bedecked with its gain-of-function laurels and showered with confetti after the victory of Afghanistan, the U.S. government turns its eye to a land war in Europe for the purpose of rescuing this bureaucratic construct from the 1990s out of Kaiser Bill by Alger Hiss and Boris Yeltsin. Americans, friends, countrymen, if we have a dog in this fight, then every dog is ours. I submit that not every dog is ours. Please do not ban me for my doubt that every dog is ours or even for my belief that we have no dogs at all. In fact, I think that if America could decide that we have no dogs in any fight besides our own, and who would fight us but to fight our dogs, this world without allies would prove superior not only for all Americans, but also everyone else. Dogs should be free to run and play. They should not be chained up all day. And the right to make war is the most fundamental attribute of national sovereignty. In our neo-Westphalian future, there are no puppet states and no fake countries. Every nation is independent. It exists by its own might. If that might fails, it disappears. Well, a man can dream, but this principled isolationism is only a way to punt the question of what should actually happen here. Let's zoom in and analyze the situation from the perspective of both players. Maybe there is a win-win plan for cooperation. Sorry, just a minute. Hello to those of you who are here. We're reading Cur Curtis Yarvin's take on Russia, Ukraine. The situation from Putin's perspective. Wargaming it from Putin's perspective, the Anschluss of the Ukraine is a great idea. However, the trouble with Putin is that his great ideas are only great in the abstract. Somehow, he never quite achieves greatness in the concrete. For instance, why isn't Crimea one of the world's jewels of real estate dotted with charter cities full of global nomads? Crimea could be like California, but with police. Instead, so far as I know, it's a half-ruined backwater ruled by some petty local thug. It seems important to caveat this discourse that if the real Putin invades the Ukraine, this will probably not be good for the Ukraine either in the long run or the short. But it should be, since this is an essay about the theory of foreign policy, rather than some kind of Moscow-sponsored tongue bath, let us imagine an abstract ideal Putin. Invading the Ukraine will probably be quite good for both real and ideal Putins. The real Putin will strengthen his image as the restorer of great Russia and firm up his internal power position. Sanctions against Russia will not harm its business as a trade surplus energy exporter. They will harm Putin's westernized opposition. And imagine if Russia demanded gold for its natural gas. The ideal Putin would turn the Ukraine into a perfectly governed jewel of the new reviving post-American and post-liberal Central Europe with traditional clothing, modern transportation, fiber, optic internet, but without porn, K-pop, or the gay. While it does seem unfortunate that this will not happen, take a walk around Moscow, preferably from your home in San Francisco, and measure the distance to the ideal. The situation from Trump's perspective. But screw Putin. Forget these Slav squatting track suited snow apes. What's in it for us? What about America? We're all good Americans here, right? And at least one uh, good Canadian. Obviously, Gray Mirror can have no influence on the Biden administration. But unless one of these Saurians keels over, we're headed straight for a Biden Trump 2024. A savage 2024. A real plate throwing showdown in America's broken marriage. Even now, we can all feel the tension winding up. We need not mention the real Trump. Obviously, I don't know the real Trump. But what would the ideal Trump do? If Trump triumphant returns to office in 2024, his first goal must not be to use power, but to take power, to relentlessly grow the scope of his office by bold, decisive action. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the idea that Trump had this full-blown war against him, not only by the Democrats, but even within his own camp that didn't actually allow him to uh, wield power and therefore he has to actually first take power grow the scope of his office by bold decisive action and the proper arena for this action is foreign policy trump's goal is to expand his power rather than getting results because results are revenue and power is capital rather than fish with his hands he makes a fishing rod action creates power because action makes precedent if trump can act on a scale on which no president in living memory has dared to act 
His enemies will be daunted and afraid. His fans will be exhilarated and emboldened. And he will find it easier not just to get results, but to take even more power. Victory creates more victory, and there is no such thing as too much power. I wonder what uh, those of you who are here watching this now or later think about Curtis Yarvin's arguments so far. So feel free to post in the chat or in the comments. Of course, if these actions are bizarre, imprudent, and detrimental to America's goals, they become counterproductive rather than productive. What Trump needs is not just enormous actions, but enormous wins as soon as possible, as big as possible. And those wins must ride roughshod over the most heartfelt beliefs and assumptions of his foes in the administrative state, then prove themselves by palpable success. It is much easier for a new president to assert his constitutional right to control the executive branch by controlling foreign policy. Since foreign policy, by definition, has no entirely domestic axe to grind, writes Curtis Yarvin, the president's right as chief executive of the executive branch to dictate the budget policy and personnel of that branch is at its clearest in diplomacy and defense abroad. Therefore, Trump needs a dramatic foreign policy win that will be palpably good for America and for the world in general, but can only be achieved by annihilating some network of power within the so-called executive branch. Ideally, the policy win is so complete that no organization can plausibly remain. The problem is simply gone. Okay, so that was a brief analysis of the situation from Trump's perspective on the assumption that it's Trump who returns to office in 2024. The goal of U.S. foreign policy in Europe. Under a Trump administration, the goal of U.S. foreign policy in Europe is to impact domestic politics in America. There are no realistic American foreign policy goals in the usual sense for Europe. Realistic foreign policy goals are either military or economic. Europe is not a military threat to the United States in any way. Europe has a trade surplus with the U.S., which means that cutting off trade with Europe would by definition grow the U.S. economy. Rather, under a Trump administration, the goal of U.S. foreign policy in Europe is to impact domestic power in America. For example, the fall of Afghanistan liquidated the organizational structures within state and DOD that supported this shambolic puppet state. This, these structures are tough, but they cannot survive the end of their purpose. The liquidation of quote-unquote Ukraine, comedian presidents, petrochemical magnates and all will be an enormous blow to both state and defense. It will suggest to all states, other client states, that Washington can no longer guarantee their quote-unquote sovereignty, whether by diplomacy or by force. But thinking only in terms of the Texas of Russia is thinking way too small. Rather, Trump should give Russia a free hand, not just in Russian-speaking territories, but all the way to the English Channel. The goal of a Trumpist foreign policy in Europe is to withdraw American influence from Europe. This will guarantee the defeat of liberalism on the continent. Some of you celebrating that prospect, some of you lamenting it. Here in America, this will show liberals and conservatives alike that liberalism is mortal, with gargantuan effects on the morale of both. And as Clausewitz said, all conflicts are mainly about morale. Liberal ideas are not indigenous to the region, they're Anglo-American ideas. They washed in on a tide of money, fashion, and bombs. And what nation has done more and better work in the last two centuries at defeating liberalism in Europe? While the Germans in the 20th century may have tried, the Russians in the 19th succeeded. Russia defeated the revolutionary dictator Bonaparte. The hoofs of the Cossack horse clattered on the cobblestones of Paris. Russia founded the Holy Alliance and anchored the League of the Three Emperors, dedicated to the blackest dyed European reaction. Russian troops quelled the revolution of 1848 and freed Hungary from liberal tyranny. Russia's reward for this was the insane Franco-British aggression of the Crimean War, an early deranged incarnation of 20th century liberal imperialism. Now it is Russia's fate to again restore order in Europe. Since America is stronger than Russia, though, Trump needs to let Putin really know it's okay to do it. There's only one way to send this message equivocally, withdraw from Europe. Again, thank you to those of you who are here. We're reading Curtis Yarvin gray mirror substack and i'm not publishing anything that was behind a paywall this is a free article of his called a new foreign policy for russia the name of his gray uh the name of his substack as you see is gray mirror gray as he always reminds us with an a okay where were we let's go back here trump will order the withdrawal of all u.s forces and diplomats all bases embassies and consulates from the continent of europe by the way, 
let me know. Do you like these streams where what I do is read articles together with you for the first time? I enjoy doing them. I would be reading them anyways. I think it's nice to include you and to go over them like this. But uh, yeah, if you're a fan, definitely hit like and do all of those things. Trump will order the withdrawal of all U.S. forces and diplomats, all bases, embassies, and consulates from the continent of Europe. Any diplomatic conversations, if any are still necessary, can be handled by email or Zoom. Public diplomacy, Woodrow Wilson's open agreements openly arrived at, is always best. If these facilities did not exist, no one would invent them. In their nominal purpose, peer-to-peer -peer communication between sovereign governments, they are anachronous. In their actual purpose, client-server supervision of satellite governments, they are obnoxious. By withdrawing all American personnel stationed in Europe, Trump is not abandoning Europe. He's setting it free, much as Gorbachev freed the Warsaw Pact. The new condition of Europe is that it need not answer to America for its form of government. Whoever rules France is the government of France. The government de jure is the government de facto. As President Monroe put it 200 years ago, quote, our policy in regards to Europe is not to interfere in the internal concerns of any of its powers, to consider the government de facto as the legitimate government for us, to cultivate friendly relations with it and to preserve those relations by a frank, firm, and manly policy, meeting in all instances the just claims of every power, submitting to injuries from none. Unquote, incredibly based, writes Curtis Yarvin. France had better not mess with us, but whether the regime in France is fascist, communist, monarchist, racist, or anarchist, we will buy their wine and sell them our Disney merch. We don't even care whether France is still France. It could split into little baronies, or it could be a province of Russia. Doesn't matter. Policy for the ideal, I wasn't going to try to pronounce it. Policy for the ideal, Putin. Given a free hand in Europe, Putin will not even need to use it. There will be no tank armies sweeping through the fall of the gap. 1976 war game style. Even a winter gas cutoff would be hopelessly heavy handed. Did the US invade the Warsaw Pact in 1989? It did not need to. It was the obvious center of gravity. Russia simply needs to provide backup and support for the counter American regimes that will naturally emerge when American influence is withdrawn. The French military, already fantasizing about a coup, will realize quickly that nothing at all prevents that coup or even requires the resulting junta to be temporary. In fact, nothing presents a coup from restoring Louis, uh, Louis XX, not to be confused with the 10th. Those of you looking at this article separately, you can click through what are these referring to Wikipedia articles. Any such regime could justify itself merely by restoring urban policy, excuse me, urban public security, safe, clean streets with no-go areas. No one who had lived through the late democratic period would forget the difference or the insanity of taking the old world for granted. Imagine... Yarvin writes, thinking of 2022-style urban squalor as normal. Many of Putin's actions seem directed at shoring up his domestic authority. This is very weak by historical standards since Putin is not in fact a Tsar. He has to pretend to be an elected democratic politician under the rule of law. This concession is his own surrender and his country's surrender to the global rule of democracy, which is or was the global rule of Anglo-America. But that was then and this is now. America has pulled out of Europe not including Britain. It follows that just as the old post-war Europe was a laboratory of democracy, the new post-war, excuse me, the new post-Trump Europe must become a laboratory of reaction. Once Putin has a free hand on the continent, every old European nation will find a helping bear paw in restoring its traditional culture and form of government. The more autocratic and legitimate, the better. It's this passage that I posted on Twitter and the author of this piece here, Europe Alone, what would Europe look like if the USA retreated from the continent? Nicolo, let me know that he had written something quite similar on his Substack. So that's why I wanted to make sure that you see this as well. I'm not sure we'll have a chance to go over it, but make sure everybody gets credit where it's due. The fundamental problem of Putin's regime is how to expand his personal power in both depth and time. In depth, he must be more autocratic, more able to personally command everything everywhere. In time, his regime must last not only his whole life, but far beyond even his life. The illegitimacy of 20th century dictatorships is a black mark on autocracy because it contradicts autocracy. A temporary autocracy has instability built in. Since the dictator of another fake post-Soviet nation, Lukashenko, must pretend to be an elected politician, no one can be sure what will happen when Lukashenko dies. Here is weakness in the strongest of regimes under the strongest of strongmen fostered, as you see in his analysis, by the need to 
fake that he's elected. Therefore, Putin's interest in occupying Europe is to field test Russia's own future as a legitimate autocracy. In other words, an absolute Tsarist style monarchy. Since every European country was at one time a monarchy, and since the concept of mob violence, guerrilla warfare, etc. in modern Europe is comical, encouraging a pool of experiments in reaction, monarchy, and autocracy, experiments whose results may be applied in Russia itself, seems like the obvious move. There is some danger to Russia in actually restoring the vitality of old Europe. Seldom has Russia been able to go pound for pound with France or Germany. But considering the state of those nations today, it will take many years for this to be a serious concern. That was Curtis Yarvin writing at Gray Mirror, G-R-A-Y Mirror, his substack on a new foreign policy for Europe. And I just maybe we'll take a minute here and go to this actually correct Ukrainian uh, hate facts update, depending on how long it is. Let me just click over to the chat for a minute. Once again, thanks for being here. I appreciate the comments. And I hope that you're finding these interesting, especially if you hadn't planned on reading them before, but do want to know what they say. All right, just for the sake of being uh, thorough here, we might as well read this update appended to Yarvin's New Foreign Policy for Europe article. And I think then we'll maybe just have another musical interlude and call it the end of our stream. But let's, uh, let's get through this first. A classic case of weird 19th century nation inventing. Posted 13 hours ago as of the time of this stream. Of course, my hyperbolic contempt for the invented country of Ukraine, from which Russia, according to our newspaper, of record is now withdrawing its diplomats, was over the top, a sort of self-parody of the Moscow propaganda discourse. While it is fun to write in this Goebbelsian vein, it is not productive and I regret it. Let me correct the record. Hopefully the Azov Battalion will not assault my home. If any of you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, they have that episode on the... Uh... Having said that, okay, so he just gave us he just gave us a free hand for Putin, but having said that, let's now see what we can withdraw or quote unquote correct. Perhaps a better description of the meaning of Ukraine is that this Ukraine is like Yugoslavia or Czechoslovakia, two historically separate but linguistically similar countries jammed together by deranged 20th century diplomats. If that fool Putin really does invade, let us hope he has the wisdom to separate them again. The first country is Malatasia or Little Russia. Malatasia, which has its own national identity, is and has always been since before the birth of the USA as much a province of Russia as Texas is an American state. Its capital is Kiev, which every educated Gen X American knew as one of the three great Russian cities. Kiev was a Russian city when America was the dominion of New England. Its second city is Odessa, another great Russian city, whence some of my ancestors came. If anyone thought my grandfathers were not Russians, it was only because they were Jews. The second country is Ruthenia. The easy way to use this historically complex label in the modern world is to define it as the area inhabited by Ruthenian speakers, but which was never part of the Russian Empire. Its capital is Lviv, or Lviv, formerly known as the Polish city of, there you go. Various parts of Ruthenia changed hands between Poland and Austria at various times, depending on who had more jazzy uniforms. Wikipedia, in its first sentence on the Ukrainian language, calls it Ukrainian, historically also called Ruthenian. As students of history, we prefer that our labels for lands and tongues not be historically changed for political reasons. Thanks, diplomats. It's easy to see from data that Ruthenian in the Russian Empire is a country language. 95% of its speakers in the 1897 census are classified as rural rather than urban, making it, as I said, a rustic Argo. Comparing it to Welsh and Wales, as he did in the previous article we read together, was funny because it was also a dig at the Welsh an Anglo tradition since Shakespeare, but it would perhaps be more correct to say that in Kiev now, Ruthenian is roughly as important as Spanish in LA. If someone told you that LA has a Spanish name and was once part of the Spanish empire, they would be telling the truth. If they told you that 30% of the population spoke as much Spanish as English, 15% of the population more Spanish than English, and 5% Spanish only, you might think they were lowballing a bit. If they told you that LA was run by Spanish-only speakers, you would be right to refuse to believe them. Moreover, Ruthenian in Polish and Austrian Galicia was not exactly a sophisticated urban language either. In the normal course of history, you can see here he's responding to people who wrote something uh, mad towards him. 
Well, okay, we'll go with the clarifications. In the normal course of history, weird rural dialects die out. However, illustrious their heritage, language spreads outward from the metropolis. Even the most distinctive rural tongues, as different from the metropolitan language as Gaelic from English, Basque from Spanish, or Welsh from any human speech, will tend to perish as fashion banishes them. Treating this Ruthenian dialect, however widespread amidst the local uh, mujiks, as a legitimate literary language, is a classic case of weird 19th century nation inventing. The strenuous cultural exercise of raising some peasant argo to ersatz importance makes sense only for one reason, to define the raison d'etre of a sovereign regime. Since the diplomatic homilies of the 19th and 20th centuries, not that they were ever followed consistently or could have been, decreed that every language should have a regime, anyone who could define a language could create a country with its right to self-determination. This rule gave us Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, etc. Clearly, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Invading this quote-unquote Ukraine, but stopping at the 1914 border of Imperial Russia, would be an incredibly based and pragmatic move by Putin. The rest of Ruthenia would rapidly fill with all the nomadic Ukrainian globalists. These folks tend to be native speakers of Russian, not Ukrainian. Some of them, I assume, are good people. But does Putin need them? Unfortunately, an ideal Putin would not only need his globalized elites, but even know what to do with them. Alas, our poor, sad world has only has the real Putin. That was Curtis Yarvin's clarification on Ukraine. You can see it at the top here, update for actually correct Ukrainian hate facts, see this clarification. And what we've been reading is this new foreign policy for Europe, as well as at the start of the stream, the Kremlin Playbook 3, Center for Strategic and International Studies. I would love to keep going, but we've been on here for an hour. Maybe it's a good time to stop. Let's actually just take a minute to listen to a little bit more of Ben Jordan, the flashbulb. I actually want to pull up here a specific song to let you know, because I was mentioning about the intricate drum beats. And sometimes the melodic lines have nothing to do with percussion. Like I think the compositions for piano, Piety of Ashes is a stellar record. Hmm. Okay, wait a minute. A flashbulb. I'm not sure I remember the name of the particular track. It could be this one. Let's see. Let me make sure you can hear that. All right, everybody, thanks for your time. Thanks for being here. Let's just let this song play us out. This is uh, The Flashbulb. All right, there you go. Hope you enjoyed that. I'm Michael Millerman. We'll have more streams on Russia, Ukraine, political philosophy, political theory. I have courses at millermanschool.com. Many, many videos on YouTube, as you know. Like, subscribe, share. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. See you guys in the next stream. Bye.